Dr. Al-Kindari, Ali Al-Kindari, is an instructor of modern and contemporary GCC history at the at Kuwait University. His PhD in Arabic and Islamic studies is from University of Exeter in the UK. His master's was in the C CCAS, Center for Contemporary Arab Studies, here at Georgetown. He graduated from there in 2009. Uh, he works on Islamism and political legitimacy in Gulf, Gulf Cooperation Council countries, where, and he's published uh, articles and participated, participated in several talks on media, in conferences, and at universities. And now he's here to share uh, real expertise on something that a lot of people, or that few people are experts on, so we're eager to hear his perspective. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. And to start with, um, there's a big ambiguity uh, talking about Muslim Brotherhood in the Gulf. I mean, it's more clear in Egypt, it's more clear in other parts of the airport, however, in the Gulf. It's not. Uh, probably it's because of the nature of the Gulf, and probably also because of the nature of the Muslim Brotherhood in the Gulf. There, the, there is a specific characteristics of uh, Muslim Brotherhood in the Gulf where they prefer uh, work uh, underground uh, the GCC for several reasons. My argument about uh, Muslim Brotherhood in the Gulf, I mean, it lays on uh, two or three uh, factors uh, or elements. Uh, to start with, it's, it's really important to understand the political system in the Gulf, which is the Sheikh, the Sheikh, which is quite different than the political system in other uh, Arab uh, countries, uh, which is the, Republic, the republics, uh, such as Syria, Egypt, or uh, Iraq. <coughs> uh, I'm not going to talk in depth about the political regime, uh, how was uh, constructed uh, because it's, it's, it's a long uh, story to talk about. Otherwise, I'm going to talk about more about the Muslim Brotherhood. But it's really important to bear in mind that we should always uh, take in consideration the context uh, of the Muslim Brotherhood, how they emerged uh, in this society where the uh, political regime, where the ruling families. GCC are legitimate in the eyes of the people. They are really legitimate. And uh, it's really, it's, we cannot say that, I mean, Muslim Brotherhood cannot and did not uh, approach changing the political system in, in the Gulf because uh, ordinary people, they look at these regimes as legitimate. So it's quite different from the Gulf than Egypt or Syria or Iraq, where Muslim Brotherhood there, they really approach to get to power. But in the Gulf, they did, they never did it. And I believe they still know. Um, I will talk a little bit about the, I mean, also, I mean, like one of the uh, elements of my argument, we should understand the, the uh, theory of domains, uh, which uh, some uh, scholars use, such as Zifar Lacroix in his uh, book on uh, Sahwa uh, Saudi. And it's also important because, as uh, Albert uh, Horani uh, mentions in his uh, book, The History of Arab, uh, Arab People, or Arab Peoples, that the Islamic society uh, was uh, I don't want to say I mean, the, the Islamic state and society, they are kind of separate, but not in the sense of being secular. And uh, <coughs> this is, you know, we can talk more about it, uh, of uh, being separate, but not secular. Uh, because the uh, legitimacy of the state, of the ruling families, or the caliphate is Islam. So it's not, it's not secular. Uh, but the separation I'm talking about, and which also Albert Horani talked about, is that we have the domain of 
this, uh, the, the society uh, or the social domain where you will see in this domain uh, Ali, uh, Mufti, uh, the uh, educational system and this domain has its own you know, uh, dynamic, its own uh, powers, its own even uh, funds uh, for example, the, you know, the, the system of Awqaf, uh, it's, a, it's a, a very important source, a funding source for this domain, for uh, which is controlled by the religious establishment. It's not really an establishment in the, in the sense of the same way on the, in Catholic Christian or in the Shia wilaya uh, or the Shaykh. But I mean, I, I mean, we're saying you know, sta religious establishment. It's it's the, the the combination of all these people who all talk in the name of Sharia or Islam. The other domain is the political domain. It's where the ruling families, where the uh, leaders, where the uh, military, and uh, so we have two separate uh, domains and two separate entities within one society or one empire, I mean, we can't say which is the Islamic empire. This system is still there in the Gulf. It crushed in other in, uh, Arab countries, Muslim countries, Turkey, Egypt, uh, Syria, Iraq, with the emergence of a modern nation state. So the modern nation state, it's a uh, it's a, it's a secular state. It imposes. It controls the uh, social domain. So there is no other two domains in the contemporary uh, Arab national state. So this is also important, which is part of the context in which uh, the Muslim Brotherhood emerged in the, in the Gulf. So Saudi, I mean, it's a religious state where you can see two separate entities of the religious establishment and also you will see the political uh, system or the ruling uh, family. Um, so this is the context and Muslim Brotherhood, I mean talking a little bit about history which is important to talk about uh, history. Uh, the movement entered uh, the Gulf really early. The first meeting was between King Abdul Aziz and uh, Hassan al Banna in Hajj in 1936. And there's a very famous, um, uh, it's, a, it's a narrative, it's not written, it was uh, descended by uh, vocal, or, I mean, Riwaya uh, Shafahiya. Uh, by Muhammad bin Fahd, Muhammad bin Fahd bin Abdul Aziz, son of King Fahd. He said, I've heard of this uh, meeting between uh, King Abdul Aziz and Hassan al Banna uh, when uh, Hassan al Banna offered uh, King Abdul Aziz to establish Muslim Brotherhood in Saudi. I mean, we're talking uh, 1936. And King Abdul Aziz agreed on this. But, and then he asked, are you who are you going to appoint uh, as a leader of the Muslim Brotherhood in Saudi uh, or in Jazeera at that time? It's still, you know, Jazeera Al Arabiya, Arab Peninsula. And then uh, Hassan bin here he suggested two people. They were Egyptians. And then King Al Aziz replied to Hassan bin saying. Well, you have forgetting. You have for. You, 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 did, you did forget one name. And he said. Somebody said. Who? He said. Myself. So, and this is the you know, conventional uh, sentence that was you know widespread that we are all Muslims and we are all brothers. And it was a smart way of uh, you know maneuvering, uh, establishing a, a movement in uh, Saudi by saying that I'm the one who's responsible of Islam and I'm the one who's responsible of spreading Islamic uh, 
values uh, and the Saudi, so you don't need to uh, spread uh, or establish Muslim Brotherhood in the Saudi. However, in Bahrain and Kuwait, they did establish a uh, mid 1940s uh, organization uh, with the help and support of uh, Egyptian Muslim Brothers. And interestingly, the way they entered Bahrain and Kuwait, for example in Kuwait, they, Abdul uh, Aziz Ali al which is the one who established Muslim Brotherhood in Kuwait, he went to the Emir at that time, Sheikh Ahmed al Jabr al and proposed this, that we are thinking of bringing this idea of Muslim Brotherhood here in Kuwait. And the Emir himself, he agreed. And this is very important that the ruling families, they did know about the establishment of the movement in their countries. But he asked Abdul Aziz Ali to change the name, not to have the same name, because Kuwait and have a, they are very sensitive of importing uh, organizations and titles from overseas, so they changed the name from Muslim Brotherhood to Jam'iyat al-Arshad al-Islam. In Bahrain, members of ruling family, they became Muslim Brotherhood. So, you may, we're talking about a very early stage of, I don't want to say alliance, but also you know, having a good relationship and accepting uh, the establishment of Muslim Brotherhood in the Gulf, starting with Bahrain and Kuwait, and not rejecting the idea in Saudi, but I mean trying to not to have this movement in the same shape how it is in Egypt. Uh, 1954 was the big clash between Jamal and Nasser in Egypt. It affected negatively the Muslim Brotherhood in the, in the Gulf, uh, where they really went dormant in Bahrain, in Kuwait, and uh, they really faced the hard, uh, hard times uh, since 1954 all the way to mid-1960s. And during 1960s, we have witnessed a uh, different approach uh, dealing with Muslim Brotherhood by Saudi, and what that was at the time of King Faisal. As uh, you see in this picture, Amir Faisal, Yaqul, Prince Faisal, uh, says at that time he was prince before being a king. Al-Ikhwan al-Talum jahadu fi sabir al-Ladi wa amwalihum wa anfusihim muslim with the good of heroes who fought in the name of God. Jahadu fi amwalihum wa anfusihim. Sorry. They fought their, themselves and, you know, they sacrificed themselves they sacrificed and their wealth. Themselves and wealth. So we can tell that it was still, I mean, the relationship between Muslim Brotherhood and the Saudi regime at that time was still good. And during the 1960s, when King Faisal the, took the throne, he, I mean, you know the expression of use and abuse. Uh, I mean, uh, this was the, the type of relationship between Muslim Brotherhood and the Saudi regime at the time of the 1960s and 1970s, where both uh, conservative regimes in the GCC and Muslim Brotherhood, they had the same enemy, which is nationalist uh, movement, which was, the national movement, you know, it was secular, and they approached to overthrow the regimes in the GCC, so, both Muslim Brotherhood, they have a problem. In Muslim Brotherhood, they have a problem in terms of uh, spreading secular ideas uh, in the GCC. While uh, the regimes had, you know, this uh, problem, of the, I mean, they wanted to protect their thrones. So we witnessed the Golden Age, and the Golden Age was at the time of 1980s, starting from 1960s. 70s all the way to 1980s when the big uh, you know, events 
happened at that year, 1979, uh, the Iranian Revolution, uh, the Juhayman incident, and uh, the Soviet invasion to Afghanistan. You know, each uh, uh, event had a different influence on this relationship between uh, the regimes, the ruling families in the GCC and Muslim Brotherhood. For example, when we talk about the Iranian Revolution, we're talking about since the Iranian Revolution succeeded in uh, removing the Shah system, uh, Khomeini, he had some, you know, sayings and some uh, expressions that, I mean, some of them they, it was obvious, some of them was, you know, was understood that it was, wasn't uh, so direct, that uh, the, the revolution is going to continue, and it's going to continue outside the borders of Iran. So it was, you know, from the first uh, moment, uh, the uh, GCC regimes, and also Iraq at that time, they felt threatened by the idea of uh, exporting the revolution. And uh, it was and the, the only way for to, to, to oppose uh, the exploitation of the revolution was by uh, flipping the, the, uh, the challenge with Iran from being a nationalist challenge, Iranian versus Arabic, to sectarian challenge from being Sunnah Shia. However, in Iraq it didn't go that way. Iraq was still in a nationalist combat. And I think it's still there. Uh, I was in Basra two weeks ago and it's still there. It's uh, Arabs versus uh, Persians. So now we have this sectarian element. Uh, which fits that in the Muslim Brotherhood, they are Sunnis, they can you know, attract the Muslim Brotherhood. And by the way, in the beginning of the revolution, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, they were, you know, they, they had their delegations to Iran because they felt that this revolution, it's, it's a success for Islamism, not necessarily being like a, a sectarian, a very you know, narrow sectarian, Revolution, but changed later on. The Soviet uh, invasion uh, affected this relationship. The way the uh, Muslim Brotherhood and the, the, the regimes became uh, better allies uh, was the idea of uh, uh, leftist, uh, atheist uh, regime to cover a Muslim country. So in this way we have to announce jihad against this atheist uh, troops and atheist uh, state invading our uh, land of Islam. So it was this slogan, you know, was supported by the uh, United States and uh, Reagan, he, you know, there's a famous statement by Reagan that he support, supported Afghani jihad. This is how he said it. He said it, jihad. The third event, which is the most important threat, especially on Saudi, which was Juhiman Al-Atebi, uh, his, his movement, and I don't want to say the incident of taking over Mecca, because the movement was earlier before the, the, the incident of seizing uh, Mecca. And, uh, this movement really threatened the legitimacy of Saudi as being the protectorate of the Islamic values where Juhayman, he started criticizing the uh, regime of being un-Islamic or being less Islamic. In the beginning, later on, they really said it bluntly that they were un-Islamic. So you can tell that all these uh, events uh, pushed uh, the regime to have a better relationship with Islamists and Muslim Brotherhood on top of them until 1990, where the problems started to emerge, problems started to emerge between Muslim Brotherhood and uh, the regime, 
what is the problem? The problem is with the American presence that was uh, called by uh, Saudi, Kuwait, and UAE uh, to come and protect Saudi in the beginning. And, uh, and the invasion, the Iraqi invasion to Kuwait was on August 2nd. The meeting between Dick Cheney at that time, he was the uh, Ministry of Defense, was on August 6th. I mean, he flew uh, all the way from Washington, D.C. to Riyadh, and he met with the king and the senior royals of uh, Saud, and then they decided that we, they would uh, uh, activate the operation of uh, Desert Shield. Uh, Desert Shield is different than the operation which liberated Kuwait later on. So Desert Shield was to protect Saudi from Iraqi troops. Justifying American presence for Islamists, and we're talking not only about Muslim brothers, but also about the Salafi movement, it was, was it that difficult? Because we're talking about an imminent threat uh, by an uh, Iraqi secular, uh, at this time, you know, Iraq, they became secular. While in the 80s they were nationalists, so you know it's the, how they played with the terminologies at the time. So secular and the, the Ba'thi ideology is uh, uh, it's an atheist ideology which rejects Islam as being the uh, source of uh, legislation. Anyway, so after the success of liberating Kuwait problems increased when some uh, Islamists started to call for American troops to leave Saudi because there's I mean this I mean there's no reason for American troops to say according to the hadith Akhriju Mushrikeen in Jazeera al Arab let the uh, non Muslims leave the land of uh, Arabs, uh, or the peninsula of our Arabs, and uh, also was about be, um, the, 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 the rejection of the American hegemony in Saudi. Uh, so it was a battle over, it was an Islamic Islamic battle, because also the Hayat uh, Kibar ulama they issued fatwas in the same way they issued fatwa in the beginning. Uh, in the beginning of the invasion, they issued fatwa after the liberation, saying that the threat of Saddam is still there. So, I mean, we cannot really, you know, let these uh, men, American troops uh, leave the country. So, the, I mean, uh, by, I mean, step by step, the, 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 the problems increased. And the calls by uh, Islamists developed not just to ask the American troops to leave Saudi, but also to have reforms. And you know, it developed little by little since 1991 all the way till 1995, which is the biggest, you know, the the, uh, the escalation of the events with the Ahdat Raida in 1995 when uh, the government decided to take uh, down all the people who led this movement, Salman al-Uda, Safar al-Tawali, uh, Nasr al-Umar, and uh, they arrested, I mean, some people estimated about 5,000 uh, people who were, who were involved in this movement in Saudi. That's a big number at uh, that time, 1995. Uh, this is a statement by uh, Prince Naif. Prince Naif, he was the Minister of Interior, saying that Al-Ikhwan Yas'awna ila Intiza' al-Qiyada wa al-Hukum Muslim Brotherhood seeks to take leadership and rule. And uh, at this time, uh, there was a feeling among the ruling family in Saudi that the Muslim, the, the, the Muslim Brotherhood betrayed the Saudi uh, uh, 
ruling family because they feel that they uh, they offered a safe haven for Muslim Brotherhood and Saudi while Muslim Brotherhood and Islamists saying that you know we we were allies I mean, it wasn't just you know wasn't just a safe haven we also did a good job in combating uh, Jamal Abdel Nasser and secular movements and Arab nationalism and all these you know uh, movements so you cannot really say that you know, it was just a safe haven. No, it's, we were Alex. What's the date of this? Of this statement. Um, yeah, when? Check. It's Brown, is it like 1995? I think 1990s or late 90s. Anyway, this was the feeling uh, at the time of 90s and 2000 but more in the 1990s. At this time, uh, let, me, let me shift my talk a little bit towards the UAE and other, because I'm trying to cover all the GCC countries and some of the good experience in the, the Gulf um, as much as I can. Uh, in the UAE, I mean, the Muslim Brotherhood started a bit late, uh, late 70s. And they benefited from the Asahwa and the what happened during the 1980s, and they uh, spread all over the Emirates, the Seven Emirates, and the United uh, Emirates until 1990, uh, nine, mid until 1994, in specific. And there was a and there's a very crucial question about what's going on today about uh, in terms of the relationship or, or why Muhammad bin Zayed has a very aggressive uh, campaign against Muslim Brotherhood. Yeah. And it's a serious question because many people are asking themselves, even Muslim Brothers, they're asking themselves why. Um, I have three, um, or there are three arguments, I'll, I'll present them quickly here and maybe we can even take three of them all at once or take one of them. One, that in nineteen in the early nineteen nineties the relationship between Muslim Brotherhood and Muslim Balak in Egypt is started to to get worse. In nineteen ninety four Husni Balak he took a tour in all GCC countries and this really happened. And, uh, for example, in Kuwait, we know it happened because the, uh, some advisors of the Emir at that time, they informed you know, many people that Hosni Barak, he asked us to have, a, to, uh, to have a stronger hand on the Muslim Brotherhood in Kuwait. But Sheikh Jabir at that time, you know, he refused because of what happened and during the, the invasion that uh, the, the internal politics of the invasion really, you know, they had a more trust in all different uh, social uh, factors. So in Kuwait, it was fine. Really react positively towards Hosni Barak's uh, request. In Oman and in the UAE, they reacted positively. And they started to crack down because they fear the Muslim Brotherhood that it will happen the same way it happened in Saudi, because also Saudi was going on since 1991 till 1995. So it could happen also in Oman and in the UAE. So uh, while in Bahrain, as we mentioned in the beginning, you know, the, 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 the president of Jamiyat al Islah, so Jamiyat al Islah is the institution, the formal institution of the Muslim in Bahrain and also in Kuwait, he was a member of the ruling family. Sheikh Isa al Khalifa. So you know, <laughs> it's a different story. I mean, I mean, you talk. I mean, you're dealing with a member of the ruling family. I mean, it's, it's a, it doesn't make sense for them to revolt or to do any harm towards the uh, ruling family. So they started to crack down little by little in Bahrain and in the UAE. So this is a, this is argument one. Argument two. 
the internal politics of the Marat is quite complex. We have seven emirates. They are different and they vary in terms of power. Abu Dhabi is the, the most influential, the most powerful of them. Second, uh, I mean, Dubai comes second. And then we have Sharjah and Ras al Khaimah, and they have a different uh, background. I mean, again, the, con the Emirati context is really important to understand that there are two big uh, alliances, tribal alliances, which is Al Qawasim versus Benyas. Uh, Benyas, Abu Dhabi, and Dubai. And we have Al Qawasim, Ras al Khaimah, and Sharjah. Benyas, they became the allies of uh, the Brits while al Qawasim they were against the Brits. So, you know, it's, you know this is the, the, the general context. I don't want to go into details. Anyway, when the Abu Dhabi, because of the oil, I mean, they, they, they have the, the money, they have the oil, they became the most powerful uh, emirate in, the, in this uh, new state that was, uh, I mean, this, the United States, the, sorry, the United Arab Emirates, uh, emerged and uh, became a state in 1971. So it's quite a new country. Uh, with their background, they were not unified. So they became united in 1971. So it's, it's, it's unlike Kuwait, it's unlike Qatar, uh, it's, uh, it's different than Bahrain. Sorry, it's a different story. So there, there is an internal rival. There are uh, uh, in competition between uh, different uh, emirates. Spe uh, more specific between Abu Dhabi and Dubai. Late 1980s, Abu Dhabi used Arab nationalists to spread their influence in different emirates. Dubai started to use and to deal with Muslim government. And the Prime Minister was, at that time, Sheikh Rashid al Maktoum, And he passed away in 1989. So, being, I mean, uh, for Abu Dhabi, Muslim Brotherhood at that time, Abu Dhabi looked at them as the allies of their competitors, the, uh, the, the, uh, Dubai. Starting from 1990s, they, I mean, uh, Abu Dhabi started to tighten on Muslim Brotherhood because of the death of Sheikh Rashid al -Maktoum. He was a strong man, and his successor was less uh, strong. Um, after his death, immediately there was two ministers uh, that were Muslim Brotherhood, and they they resigned but because of the pressure of Abu Dhabi. So this is the second argument about why uh, Abu Dhabi had this Severe uh, campaign against Muslim. Also, there's. I'm, I'm still digging this, researching this, that there was also another competition, even among the ruling family of Al Nahyan. <coughs> For example, Sheikh Sultan, because it was the first was Khalifa, and then Sultan, and then Muhammad. So Sultan also, some of his close friends, close people, they were also Muslim brother. And then he took him down. So, I mean, it's more of, I mean, uh, it's all about I mean, politics, in terms of politics of getting to power. Uh, argument three. There was a fear of the Muslim brotherhood because they are everywhere. They are in all different uh, sectors of the, of the state. They are in the seven states. Uh, 
God forbid, whatever uh, political shake or problems occurred or any threat on the legitimacy of the ruling family, there is an immediate replacement, which is the Muslim Brotherhood, because they are organized, they are everywhere, they have a united leadership, and they have a, a, a connection all the way from Ras al Khaimah to Abu Dhabi. And if you can imagine the, the map of the UAE. We, can take, we, we can't take uh, one of these arguments, we can take three of them. So, to, in order to understand the, uh, the incentives behind this campaign against Mr. Brotherhood. September 11th happened in 2001 and jihadism started to take momentum and again there's a need to have the same old alliance to get it back this time with a different enemy which is a radical Islamic transnational movement uh, st started to take legitimacy and to have more legitimacy, legit legitimacy than uh, current uh, states, not only in the, in, the, in the Gulf but also in the Arab world. And we have the charismatic uh, character of Osama bin Laden, and he started to attract all people from. Arab world, not necessarily being religious and young men, but also in, uh, angry men against the American intervention and also American support to Israel. So they have the, 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 the model, they have the leader, and they have the place to go, which is Afghanistan. So we have a big problem at this time. So the state went back again to not only the Muslim Brotherhood but also the Sahwa which is, you know, they share so, so much, so many I mean, uh, ideas and values with the Muslim Brotherhood, even tactics, even ideas, even the way of mobilizing. So, some, I mean, I mean they are separate by the same. So you cannot really, you know, separate them too much, you cannot, but they're not unified. And this is the picture of, um, this, uh, of uh, Alman al auda and you can see that above, you see that Hajar <coughs> al-Zawiyah, my Sheikh al-Dr. Salman al auda Hajar al-Zawiyah is the cornerstone. This was the most influential program was played on NBC. You know NBC, mm -hmm. if you're not familiar, is owned by uh, Saudi Royals, the most famous um, TV network in the Middle East. And they used to play it in the highest uh, and the best time of the week after Jum'ah played. <laughs> and they used to let Salman al auda to discuss with, uh, what is his name, Mdefer. Huh? And Mdefer, he's now, you know, also running uh, another show on Rotana. But this was big at that time because it meant to change the ideas of youth, not to revolt, not to go radical, not to be against the state. And it took uh, quite quite time, several years. I mean, Hajar Zawiya Kornason was the most influential uh, program at that time. It took him at the time of 2000, in the late 2000, all the way till 2011. 
Also, Muslim Brotherhood at that time, they really worked hard, hard in grabbing their youth not to uh, join Al-Qaeda because Al-Qaeda at that time they had different people in not only the Gulf but also in all different parts of the Arab world but also in the Gulf because it was the uh, target of Al-Qaeda to attract youth and people from there not because when they attract people and youth from uh, the Gulf and they're not just attracting uh, soldiers but they're also attracting money so who was their target for Al-Qaeda so the alliance is back but was cautious at this time uh, there is a statement I mean uh, again Suriwaya Shafahiya it's an oral uh, testimony or an oral I mean, because you know the Gulf I mean, we don't write that much <laughs> we rely more on the uh, you know, oral and uh, narratives is it I mean uh, saying that King Salman at that time was a like Prince Salman he said you know Salman al Uda, he's a good guy but we cannot trust him and this really important and gives a very important indication that they they want to deal with Sahwa they want to deal with Muslim Brotherhood but not just to deal but they want to control but they're not really they don't have uh, full control so they don't have full trust of them because of what happened in 1990s you know uh, I'll skip I'll skip the other I can't talk about it probably <coughs> and I'll go I'll jump all the way to Arab Spring the same program of cornerstone Salman al Oda and other Saudis, even other Gulfies, started to praise Arab Spring. And this was the beginning of the end of the harmony or the relationship, or I mean, we say the cautious relationship, or the cautious alliance between the Sahwa or the Muslim Brotherhood and uh, Gulf of Dreams. And it's important, I mean, probably I, I should be more careful in, in, in explaining this. Dif I mean, each, each regime, each ruling family has a different way of dealing and treating Muslim Brotherhood. Kuwait is different. Bahrain is a totally different story because in Bahrain, during Arab Spring, the most powerful force supported the ruling family was Muslim Brotherhood. So it's a total different story against the Shia because in Bahrain, the, 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 the Arab Spring started united all different uh, social sectors, but later on it turned to be uh, sectarian. I mean, I don't want to go into detail because it's, it's a long story, but this is what happened. So Muslim Brotherhood, they led uh, Sunnis, and they marched, and they gathered in what's known in uh, Al-Fatih uh, Mosque. Uh, I mean, tens of thousands of Sunnis they march, and this is the, this is the photo, and uh, I chose the fo this photo, this is from the al uh, gathering in Bahrain, and you can see that all flags of GCC, because what they're saying is, uh, one destiny, one people, because if, you, if the GCC did not support the Sunnis in Bahrain, the next will be other Gulf states. And it's not in the sense of uh, the, the, the success of Arab Spring, but it's the success of Iranian intervention. So it's, it's important to have this. Uh, Saudi and the Emirat, there you know, they're waging this campaign and it's still going on. Oman, it's different. 
they have all they, they still have this cautious relationship with uh, Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, by the way, there's a Muslim Brotherhood in Allah. Because there's so many they don't know that there's a Muslim Brotherhood or not. But uh, they are really underground. I mean Romanis they know them, but you know, even people in the Gulf they don't know. <laughs> so it's fine, you know. Uh, so uh, Sultan Qabus is really cautious in, in, in the way of dealing with Muslim Brotherhood. Not only Muslim Brotherhood, because in Oman and the Arab Spring 2011, uh, they also revolted against Sultan Qabus. I mean, they did. They did not revolt. They they went on the streets because they had in their intakes on the government on corruption and unemployment issues. It's a more of economic uh, march uh, and uh, protests against the regime. None of the uh, Arab Spring happens in the Gulf asked for, or for regime change except for Bahrain. So it's different. Happened in Kuwait was known by Karim uh, al-Khotan, dignity of the country, uh, about uh, 70,000 Kuwaitis went against corruption, against uh, bad uh, services, bad economy at that time, but it was mainly against corruption. So Arab Spring really you know, made, uh, made the uh, ruling families in the Gulf fear change, any kind of change, because they know how it starts, but they don't know how it's going to end. It started taking down uh, regimes in far countries, started with Tunis, Niger, and what came all the way to the region. Uh, anyway, they counter the uh, Arab Spring emerged in 2013 with the coup against uh, Morsi and then uh, things started to change in another direction so today. <coughs> future prospect uh, how is it going to be in, in, in the future um, um, well it is difficult to eliminate Islamists, especially in the Gulf, uh, with this campaign against Muslim Brotherhood. And there is no agreement among the ruling families in the Gulf in this approach towards uh, Islamists and towards uh, Muslim Brotherhood. So it's going to be really difficult to have this notion of uh, deleting or eliminating the Muslim Brotherhood. How is it going to be? I mean, both sides are losing with this campaign. The Muslim Brotherhood and the regimes at, at the same time. I mean, we understand for the uh, Islamist and Muslim Brotherhood, but for the regimes, I mean, we're talking about the weakening of legitimacy of these states. Uh, and I mean, we're talking about conservative uh, regimes uh, built its uh, its legitimacy on on religion, and uh, at the time you attack uh, prominent figures, uh, not only in Saudi, in Emirat, and it's more specific in Saudi and Emirat. It's size and and, and and controlling the public space, and private space, by force, as, you know, Janjak Rousseau said, you know, it could uh, succeed for a while, but not for a long time. Uh, so, it will succeed for a while, but not for too long, because, I mean, the, I mean with, any, with any shape, with any political, you know, change, or economic change, as you know, Jamal Khashoggi you know, predicted a year ago that 
and then three to five years, if nothing, no serious change happened to Saudi, the economic, uh, economic factor really will, will put a real pressure on the regime, and at that time, you cannot really use the uh, religious uh, movement of the Muslim Brotherhood or Sahwa or Islamist in order to gain back legitimacy. So it's a tough time. We don't know how, is it gonna, how long is it going to take, but see, I mean, by the way, this is a picture. This is an ironic picture. This is King Abdullah. Uh, this is Sheikh Khalid al Mathkur, he's the president of Jamiat al Islam in Kuwait. <laughs> so <laughs> it was his visit to Kuwait and he met with the president of the Jamiat al Islam, Mr. Brotherhood in Kuwait. Um, thank you, and I'm open for any questions.